So howdy. Welcome and thank you for tuning in to this virtual reception to join artist Mayuko Ono Gray for discussion and Q&A about her show titled A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words at the Wright Gallery. So it's fall 2021 and we are back on Texas A&M campus. Hosting virtual events happens to allow us to engage even more students beyond our gallery walls and beyond the timelines of the events. So to explain the recordings from Mayuko on campus today will be in a video on the Wright Gallery YouTube channel in the beginning of October. So with us live today on Zoom, we have visitors and students joining in from multiple locations. We've got a figure drawing class and members from the Wright Gallery Curatorial Committee. So for those who may be engaging with the Wright Gallery for the very first time, we're located in College Station, Texas, in the College of Architecture. We're on the second floor of Langford Architecture Building A. So my name is Rebecca Pugh, and I'm the curator of the Wright Gallery Lecturer in the Department of Visualization. My co-host, Dr. Tiana Uchaz, Assistant Professor in the Department of Visualization, teaches our new three courses. Mayuko is a Houston-based artist with gallery representation at Hooks Epstein Gallery in Houston and Galleria 910 in Mexico. So throughout um, Mayuko's childhood, growing up in Gifu, Japan, she trained as a calligraphy master and then also studied Western drawing practices uh, in charcoal and graphite. She completed her Master's of Fine Arts in painting from the University of Houston. And each of her works in her solo exhibition here at the Wright Gallery, an abstracted Japanese proverb uh, runs in a continuous line from top right to left following traditional Asian writing. So cultural styles emerge in all of these works, along with subjects that are true to what she enjoys to draw. So she enjoys to draw her cats, her family, her colleagues, and even a fish that she caught in the Gulf. So lighthearted subjects combined with very timely scenes. For example, um, I'm very excited to have her very recent work from 2020, Chrono Breakfast, with uh, a scene of the breakfast table with the coronavirus particles floating, and even um, a drawing of takeout food. And I think we could relate to takeout and time at home um, during the pandemic. Um, first, we'll open the floor to Mayuko to make any comments or discuss any works of hers. Um, and then Tiana's gonna connect uh, Mayuko's work to her art history classes and share some questions submitted by her students. And then I will share questions submitted by visitors and students in advance. And then in the last 10 minutes of the event, we're gonna open the floor to taking questions from Zoom. So at this time, I'll um, see if Mayuko would like to comment on the show or any of the works. Yeah, sure. So since you already mentioned, let's talk about the Corona breakfast. I'm hoping it's in the camera, but if not, please come see it in person. So um, I work from photographs a lot. So I just happened to have my camera by me uh, at teaching. So this scene was right after the lockdown started. Um, my husband decided the kitchen table was his office. So there's already all the stuff there. Pretty chaotic. In the beginning, we were so nervous, like what's happening. But I was just trying to have nice breakfast, just to chill. So I was trying to be calm. And then my cats decided to join me, like get on the table, all the mess. And I just thought it was like, really comical in a way. So I grabbed my camera, took a photograph of the image, but yeah, so the Japanese proverb I used for this work is, it's same as the title for the show, a picture's worth a thousand words. So it's just how we see this chaos 
in our lives on the news, TV, and at the same time, we can see the virus that is causing all these visible changes in us. So that's where the inspiration here came from. Wonderful. Um, as I said, we're so thrilled to have you here at the Wright Gallery. Um, many classes have toured, um, whether individually or in small groups. Um, so at this time, I'm going to open the floor up to Tiana. She's got some um, great questions from students. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and thank you, Mayuko. Uh, my class thoroughly enjoyed discussing the work uh, yesterday. I teach a course on the history of global art from 1400 to 1900. And since we're just a few weeks into the class, we've just, we're finishing up with a module on the Renaissance. And so in reading your artist statement, my students were, were keen to make connections and to notice some of the terms that you'd use like schemato and chiaroscuro and to hear about your, your training um, because it resonated so much with some of the, the graphic works that we've looked at already. And then coincidentally, yesterday, we were talking about the work of Hieronymus Bosch and Peter Bruegel, both of whom incorporated proverbs into their works of art. So it's been a very fruitful conversation. And I'd like to actually start maybe by then picking up on what you just um, discussed, your Corona breakfast. Um, the students had a, a lots of questions about it. Maybe we'll start with the, the first, and that is the cats. Are the cats looking at the virus particles? Are they eager to look at the food? Um, and is there um, some kind of significance in the direction of their gaze? That's a good question. I think both, <laughs> because they are definitely watching the food. But see, once a cat is still looking at the food, but the other one's looking as a direction. And I kind of believe that cats can see things we can't see, like a ghost or whatever. So I, I was curious if the cats could see the virus or, uh, yeah, I don't know. They also had questions about some of the other elements in your work in this particular um, drawing. Was there significance to the Y and the U of the Scrabble letters? Was this an encoded message for the viewer, or was it completely random? Completely random. Completely random. <laughs> I just think that, yeah, Victoria Blaine. But I mean, see, that's a power of a word. When you place a word, people switch the way they look at this art. Now they, you're stuck on the letters of the word instead of looking at this uh, image. Well, and that's a great segue into the next set of questions that we have, which really engage with the, the proverb um, in, your, in your work. So we wanted to ask questions about your process. What comes first when you're creating a work of art? Do you have the proverb in mind and then you try to find imagery to fit with it? Or do you have a series of, um, kind of image ideas and then later on, Kind of try to think about what proverb might fit that way. It's a chicken and egg question. Yeah, um, it really depends. I think earlier works, like small works I made back in 2017-18, it, it was mostly from the proverb. So I had the proverbs which include um, rabbits, deer, tiger, so I would Google them. Some of the images from like Wikipedia. So earlier works was yes, proper first and try to fit the image to it. But I think the more recent ones are from photograph I take and the finding the proverbs that works with the image. Oh, interesting. So. You were talking about the, the early work that focuses on the, the calligraphy and, and the, the shift now, but the calligraphy is very interesting to, um, to my students. And we have, we want to know, how do you decide on the path that the calligraphy takes? And here in Corona Breakfast, for instance, my students noticed that up at the top, the calligraphy is very tightly knit, it's dense, it's darker, and it seems to loosen um, and, and actually lighten as it gets towards the bottom of the piece. 
And we had a question about whether that was an aesthetic decision um, in terms of highlighting contrast, or was there significance to that? Some of the students imagined that maybe um, it might have to do with a much more tensely wound anxiety at the beginning of the pandemic that maybe releases over time. And so we have so many questions for you. <laughs> um, so I started out drawing the out as a proverb word by, word by word. And then I start really connecting them gesturally. So it looks really crisp clean, like I did it in one line, but I just a lot of erasing went, went into it. So, um, so I started connecting them into one continuous line. So again, each word, I have one entrance as the agent writing goes top to bottom, right to left. So there's usually one entrance and the other line as I work on the connecting, again, it's very gestural and the has one exit. And it is really for aesthetical manner because like many people do not read the Japanese characters. So this to me is like a foreign music, like a music in foreign language. Like you enjoy the reason, but I have no idea what the lyric says, but you know, enjoyable. So I try to do that visually. I want to make sure the lines are interesting enough, even without needing or able to read what it says. And there's a darkness and lightness of the line. It really also is just aesthetically how I want to balance out. Again, with graphite, it's really light and dark. So some areas I like to keep um, high contrast, light and dark, dark and light. Some areas I want to have light and light, kind of diffusing area. Some areas dark and dark. So for this image, since everything's really dense on the bottom, even there's a bottom table and goes to underneath, so everything was heavy. So that I liked in the beginning, so very beautiful. But I just felt like I needed more balance on the um, upper area. Like on the left side is a door and the character is also really light. That's because I didn't want to have too much attention there. But yeah, the reason I have this um, top darker, it's just to balance out a little bit. So it didn't have any reason why I made it dark. It just it, uh, visually, it made more sense. Thank you. And my students also noticed that sometimes the calligraphic line becomes almost sculptural. It takes on a three-dimensionality. Other this one, right? And like um, we had similar questions about whether that was significant. Um, but now I imagine that are, are those same kind of decisions about the sculptural quality of the line? Is that also more of an aesthetic choice or does it ever carry meaning with it? No, it is an aesthetic, aesthetical reason. So like the lines are on top are really three dimensional, almost metallic. Because I felt like, again, it needed some way there. But the lines going across the kitchen table, I just thought the other areas are already rendered with many different shades of gray. I just uh, felt it made the most sense to leave it just white rather than try to fight it. Again, it's pushing pulling. And for those who do read Japanese, are the letter forms and the words, are they recognizable or has your gestural approach abstracted them to such a degree that they are illegible? Sometimes it's they do, but all these titles are in Japanese underscore English. So the first part is what's actually written out. So each chapter you can pick up by looking at this title label, Yes, so yes, yeah, some areas I try to keep the original letters, but sometimes as I, you know, work on it, it gets disappears sometimes. Also had a series of questions about um, your training and creative practice. Um, you note in your artist statements, differences between the environments in which you were trained. 
um, the, the, and the media you were using, of course, the fluidity of the, the calligraphic line sitting on a tatami mat, and then the switch into a Western studio space for training. And we were wondering, um, could you expand on the role of environment of creative practice and the way that it affects the kind of art you produce? I can only speak from my own experience that, again, my first form of art was calligraphy. And I didn't even think it was art. I thought they were just for, you know, good handwriting is a virtue in Japan. So my mom wanted me to go. I mean, a lot of the kids go there. But the practice with calligraphy is that you receive your master's sample and you have your 50 sheets of a rice paper and you try to copy the master's sample and you try to copy and when you're done, you go to the next. So you do over and over and over just to looking at the line quality. So I think it really helped me see things, not just the character, I mean, Japanese characters. So when I went to the Western drawing school, it was in a way same because it asked me to have its observation skill, to look at the lines, the sides of the still light. So again, looking at the sample, in this case, still light, and putting that in my paper, looking at that. So again, it, it was a training of capturing the accuracy or the angle, size, whatever that is, but with Western drawing, it's one sheet of paper, three hours, you stay with it. So even though they, are, they seem different, but for me, it was really training of the eye. I think that's why I like to have a photography, photograph as my source, because again, it helps me to have something to look at and try to make my own. So the calligraphy sample, still life, I, just it's almost like that's how I grew up is to look at something and put it on paper. So showing the process of looking at things. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, your work draws on, on both of these artistic traditions and trainings. Um, we're wondering how much of this fusion is, is intentional and how much of it is actually in your body as somebody who's trained. You know, you're talking about. Um, learning to look um, through calligraphy and that being something that you pushed further in um, or that you used at least in the um, in your training in the, the drawing studio and I guess part of me is asking about the embodied practice of being an artist would you ever be able to disentangle these two traditions in your work now or are they just inevitably and invariably fused together for you so I, I had a time like right after grad school, like I felt stuck. So that was before I started any calligraphy incorporation in my work, I was doing the, you know, realistic photorealism drawing of the figures and stuff. But I met um, Dr. Izat Abdush, who was a retired physician taking painting class after college. And his work was painting of the Arabic um, calligraphies. So his subject was a calligraphy. So it really hit me. Like, you know, I did a calligraphy growing up and I really wanted to try that with myself, my own practice. So I started, of course, first a few works, uh, you know, blocks, like first the pancake is always block. So he did it down the best, but I started doing the lines and creating calligraphy and connecting. That's how it started. And now, but, so I used to just the calligraphy, no image, but I missed the doing the images too. So I started incorporating them together and I'm really excited, but at the same time, I do have more evolution in my work. So there are some works I was playing with a grid system. I had some, I made works with dots inside. So I am still like trying to, you know, move 
not to stay where I am right now, but yeah, I am pretty, like, I feel like, yeah, I'm doing, like, my own work, having both Western practice, Japanese sensitivity. So, but I don't know, tomorrow I might say I quit to do, some, do something <laughs> else, you never know. <laughs> My students had a couple of other questions about specific works of art. Um, your work of art, Fortune Cookie, um, they, were, they were quite taken by that. And they wanted to know if there was a significance to the choice of Panda Express. Yeah, I don't know the same purpose, Auntie, you said about Panda Cookie. You know, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, well, if you wanted to connect, oh, I'm a giant agent, but no, it was nothing like that. It just did. That work and other work, sometimes I just don't know what I want to make next. Sometimes when I work on art, I get the idea of the next work. Okay, when well, I'm done with this, I want to do that. But sometimes I don't. So I just, just start looking through all my JPEG files or just take photographs of things around. And that was like, all oh, that shininess of the clear plastic was just interesting. So I so sometimes I just do start making and as I make I start to you know get more connected to the subject and it was one of the I just how did you get started because you know making art like you have to stay on this momentum if you stop it's like really hard to get back to sometimes so yeah. But it turned out really interesting. And I think it's a high contrast because I made it so dark in the background and made it the middle of the character, which is a lack of happiness to kind of glow white in the middle. So yeah, it worked out. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear you point out the um, just, just the, the reflective quality of the, the plastic because actually that's something that my students picked up on too. And they wanted to know, um, there seemed to be a, a focus on the wrapper, right? On the, the wrappings of the fortune cookie rather than the cookie itself, even though the, you know, ostensibly the piece is titled cookie, but actually it seemed to be more of a study of the packaging. And so they were really curious to hear you say more about that. Yeah, what you just did is that you say it was a study of the plastic. So I just wanted to focus on like, um, just anything, like yeah, I think Rebecca said she had the assignment of having something insignificant to make yeah. it like, right, yeah. It, it's just sometimes it's visually interesting, you want to spend time. Yeah. What was your? I would give my students the option to do a, an optional assignment where they would make something very insignificant, make very powerful and significant through shifts of scale and perspective and contrast. Mm -hmm. So contrast. Similar, that's a great example to have on view for the students to see that empty wrapper made so powerful and dominant in that composition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I think in our class for a moment, we also fell into the same track that we did here because you can make up some of the, the, the letters on the packaging and, you know, all, all of a sudden the mind, the mind, you're right, it goes straight to text all the time because we're so used to interpreting text. That's something we get trained to do from when we're, we're young. So I think my, my students are appreciating that we're, we're now in a class where we are learning to read images mm -hmm. a little bit more deliberately. So your work has given us an incredible opportunity to do that. You. Well, that was really great. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to get the questions from the students. They were really great. So, in the right gallery, we have a form at the entrance where we have collected visitor questions. As well, we've collected um, questions from students and visitors digitally. Um, so, I have quite the list of almost over 20. Um, we had a museum studies class visit this morning. And they left even more, which is excellent. So my first questions that I'm going to ask on behalf of the students are more general questions, but most of them toward the end are about drawing because I teach drawing courses. So the first question, and this is actually an anonymous question, they didn't leave their name. They said, so they noticed several of your titles suggest a connection to death and entropy, uh, for example. Hello is the end of the beginning. Art is long, life is short. 
what about this theme of death or uh, entropy um, inspire you? Or does it, it doesn't inspire you at all? Is that um, just a, a different interpretation? You know, it's, it's, it's all my works of, uh, it's so little bit of before my master's thesis show at the grad school, I almost died. But I didn't die and I work up and like 10 specialist doctors were like, we don't know why you came back. <laughs> anyway, so I, I remember like I was dying, I was hemorrhaging, so I was like just getting weaker, weaker. And like, I, I, I was like, oh, dying is not bad. And like when I came back, yeah, I almost, I mean, I cried because I had to go back to this world. and. So since then, my view of death and the existence really changed. But still, we all have, I mean, you teach art history, it's all about the religions because people don't know what's gonna happen after death, so they give the money to charge so they can go to heaven or, you know, however it is. It's just something universal, it's like humans, a bone, we live, we die, and nobody knows the reason why. So I kind of want to capture glints of the episodes up. And these proverbs really have deep, deeper teaching. So it's the teaching of the people who lived before, just how you should live, how you should embrace things. And yeah, that's, that's really what my work is about. That's really interesting. That was a really great comment and question. And um, so the next really interesting question is, so do you see art in moments or do you transform moments into art? I said that was an interesting question because it's 50-50. Sometimes like the corner breakfast, I saw the scene, I had to capture it, I had to make something else. But sometimes I just find the images for completely interesting or something start. So yeah, it's both ways. Um, and I'm going to throw one of my personal questions in there. Um, do you ever maybe wish that you had your camera with you or you missed a certain scene that you wish that you had captured for referencing your drawing? Yeah, I do. And at the same time, sometimes you see something like awesome, but when you take a photograph, it just doesn't translate. Like, you know, like you take a photograph of a beautiful sunset, but it's like, you know, it's like, oh, it doesn't look that good. But yeah, I do have that. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get into some of the process questions about your drawing practice. Well, maybe first, can you describe your studio? So how you work? Are you, for example, in the same spot? Are you listening to music? Are you on a ladder? Are you on a scaffold? Or if you could describe that from uh, the drawing student. Sure. Um, if you want to follow me on the Instagram, it's in my Yuko underscore Ono underscore Gray. So sometimes I take um, work in progress photos and post it. So it is one of the bedrooms in your house. Um, so one wall, I totally sanded down all the texture so I can actually uh, put my work onto that wall. And I do have small scaffolding uh, rollers in me for the larger work. And I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Like I, I know like some people make fun of audiobooks, like it's all the lady thing, I don't know, but I listen to audiobooks and I draw, like it's amazing. You get both things at the same time, you're making art and you get all this knowledge. And I do listen to a lot of um, like the spiritual things, like, you know, Ecocolic and the Alan Watts and all those, uh, yeah, things. But yeah, audio bit. Great. And you've already shared that you work from um, your photographs. More questions about your drawing practice. So what compels you to draw at such a large scale? And do you prefer to work, to work large or not? Um, right now, I love making large works. And I don't know why, because I had a um, 2000 
seven, eight, I think. I made a bunch of smaller pieces. But right now, a larger work works for me. I don't know why. It's kind of like you get the craving. Sometimes you want it to stick. Sometimes you want a salad and you don't know why, but you do kind of. So yeah, I, I don't have any reason I decide to go large or small, just how I feel. Okay, wonderful. So we actually had students from three different academic departments help to install the exhibit. And I think when we were all hanging them together, some students were wondering about the separate panels. One question from Abigail, did you draw the panels separately or did you draw them together? I draw them together. All right. Right. And the panels are uh, because the roll of the paper I like to use only comes in 42 inches wide. So if the works larger than that, I just have the panels and that's only reason why. That's great. So speaking of size of the works, Jenna has asked, how do you arrive at the size of each of the finished works? And are any of them cropped, so to speak, from even larger original uh, versions of your photographs? Yes, I, I, I do crop some. I think, yeah, using Photoshop to uh, creating great little cartoons, and I, I can move that. And, uh, and the sides wise, I have uh, this um, rule I make which is I finish one work a month. So like during the summer, I can afford to work on larger piece because I have the summer off, so I can make larger piece. But when I'm about to work, then I try to stay smaller. It just it helps to have your own deadline, you know, gives up yourself. So yeah, larger ones are mostly from summer or in a way, like the COVID situation really helped me. So I got to stay home and work. So I would actually, you know, didn't have to get ready for work or, you know, commute. So I, I was very uh, productive during COVID lockdown. Uh, Macy asked, how and why did you choose your medium graphic? That's interesting. I do like, I think, again, my calligraphy background and it's a drawing studio, charcoal graphite. And I also did comic books. I wanted to be a comic book artist. Again, it is black ink. So I think I was like really trained in that. And like, so I painted because I was a painting major, but I, I think the color was more boring to me and color just has so much significance or the ideas already attached to it. Like there's one called, if you see orange patch, oh, it must be pumpkin or it's just so much more complication to the color. So I think I tried, I did investigate that by painting whole school, but I think my real, like a true love of who I am, it's uh, in the grayscale. I think that's why. And charcoal just gets too messy if you're using your home um, studio. And uh, yeah, I, I like the charcoal too, but sometimes it's a vine charcoal, it's just too um, powdery. Do you lose the line you just created? I, and so graphite has more flexibility and also comes in different shapes can age to can be, which I can really play with. So I think that's what I like. Carlos wants to know, how many pencils do you go through? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but mainly, so again, I love my Mitsubishi can be pencils. So that is the darkest star you see in my work. And yes, I have the pencils and I go through them a lot. So do you have a wide collection of tools, different draw, uh, different erasers, different shapes, mm -hmm. different um, stumps for blending? Any yes. different pencils? Yes, stumps for 
blending. I also use a chamois when I want to just to add a lighter value in the area. I do that. And of course, the erasers, uh, kneaded eraser, hard eraser. I also have the 2.3 needy make the mono click click. I recently purchased electric eraser oh, for the yes. first time and I'm right. like, oh my God, this is fun. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yes, Thomas noticed that. Thomas had asked if, if you use the eraser. Um, so Thomas actually was, he was asking, um, so the eraser, you use the eraser as a drawing tool, but he is asking if you ever blend using the eraser. And if not, if you can talk about your blending techniques. Yeah, I don't use the eraser to blend. Yeah, but I do use um, eraser as tool. So eraser is not really for erasing mistakes, but it's also another tool, tool to bring back the whiteness or um, just tamper down some darkness a little bit by going over with um, needed the eraser. So again, I oh, like the so finished work seems really like clean, but I erase so much in my studio. I have erased a gutter system by the wall, so all the eraser that goes in there. Wow. So again, drawing, erasing, maybe it's like 60 40. Like erasing is definitely part of drawing. That's amazing. And something um, I, I emphasize in my drawing class right now is, um, and I don't know if this is how you work, but um, one strategy is you could work light to dark. Um, do you work light to dark or dark to light? Or do you finish one spot of the composition at a time? Or do you work on the entire composition together? So definitely light to dark because the paper is white. I mean, like in the drawing class, it's fun to start with the mid gray and add the white, that it's dark. But yeah, for me, with the graphite, it kind of gets dirty. If it's a charcoal, it's good to start with the mid gray. But yeah, so I usually start working all the focal points, like the obvious cats or the plate, it's the areas I really want to preserve first. And then I start adding the calligraphy. So I go back and back and forth, back and forth. Right. Um, so Chloe asks, so given the nature of graphite and working on paper, um, how do you preserve the works? I use this spray fixity. So once the work's finished, I attach them to styrofoam, to styrofoam foam board. And then I take that to backyard and spray fix when it's not raining and not too windy. And you mentioned earlier um, the use of um, the linen hinges on the side. Yes. Um, so a lot of great things for my drawing students to learn from when they're visiting. One, one thing, so large pieces, I roll them into a tube, the idea is glassine paper on the surface. And why is that? You can share for the students. So it doesn't smear the white glassine paper over any other type. The glassine paper is, I mean, is created for preserving like architecture drawings, the like NASA, I heard it uses samples of uh, old, you know, school drawings. Um, could you discuss some of your inspirations? Um, my inspiration, like for example, um, you could talk about your inspiration of your um, self portraits. Yeah. Or the still life examples over in the corner over there. Yeah, so my real inspiration is investigation of life and death in a way, or impermanence of the things. Like, I'm gonna be gone, you're gonna be gone, this chair's gonna break sooner or later, everything's gonna be gone. Like I'm working on still life right now, which again, I have a lot of bubbles like this one because we are made of atoms that's just moving around. Like we don't see that with some own eyes, but it just fascinates me everything to hear. We have emotions, we don't know why, and you know, things come and go. 
Yeah. But try not to be too dark about it. But I tried to add a little humor here and there. Right. Um, so I'm just really quickly looking over some of the questions that were left this morning by the museum studies class. Why was still life such a focus of most of the art subject? And why the landscapes? No, landscapes, that's true. Yes, I don't know. I think most of the things come from my domestic setting, so it's mostly in my house. Right, yeah. And I find that really interesting to have so many works that have imagery uh, portraying time spent in home, um, especially with you know the lockdown that we had, for example. So there are so many interesting things about all these works together in the art gallery. So it's a, yeah, uh, subject could be banal, like, but that, that's where I am. And I might take such the insignificant scenes or insignificant moment, make it do something else. Great. All right. So it looks like we've gone through most of the questions. We have one really unique question here from Grace. Uh, Grace actually asked about the exhibit design here, um, and it, it was a choice to place feeding in the middle of the exhibit, and if so, why? Um, it's probably from Museum Studies class. Um, so we could share just a little bit about the exhibit design and plan. So Mayuko and I collaborated um, virtually, actually, to plan the, the layout of the exhibit, which is unique during a pandemic. Um, so we met on Zoom and planned out with a digital model of the gallery. And um, I guess my, my motivation of the seating um, here was that you can sit and spend time with such a large work um, and kind of see the all angles of the gallery. So that was a really great question from the museum studies. Yeah, I think Rebecca really did a great job creating like sections by section. So you have like this small section there where you only have the self portrait, you stare. So I think you did a re really amazing job of like, you know, dividing the gallery space into little corners. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you. Um, so we are at the time of the event where we are going to have a 10 minute question Q&A with our live Zoom audience. Yes, we have a question from our students uh, from um, Arts 212. Uh, Maria Clara. Yeah. Maria? Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. Do you ever return to a finished piece, or do you prefer to leave pieces alone and work on new ones? Can you repeat that first? Oh, yeah. Can you ask, do you ever return to a finished piece, or once it's done, it's done? Um, yeah, once it's done, it's done. Like, I have a rule. When it's done, I sign my name after sign my name. I spray fix, I might take off smudges with the needed eraser, but I just move on. Sometimes the work is not like 100%, but you just have to move on sometimes. Also, uh, my questions from the students, uh, how you can, dis can describe uh, percentage of knowledge and uh, in, uh, intuition, intuition part of your work, it's 50 by 50 or Domination of intuition and uh, your, uh, your, like, you know, traditional school is kind of like a background. He's basically asking how much of your work process is based on intuition versus um, your formal way of how you would plot to draw and now how you just kind of go through and what percentage would we say of each category? I just say 50 50. Like um, placing the Japanese calligraphy, again, that process is very gestural, it goes everywhere. And again, when I start rendering them, I decide which areas I make dark or light. I, so that's, yeah, intuition. 
in that I'm doing executing my intuition with my skills. So it's a go on it. Uh, and the other question from the students, uh, do you change your idea in the end of the progress uh, if you compare with beginning, for example? Uh, my ideas change, right, in the end? So your idea for the work, how does it change from the beginning of the drawing process to the end? Sometimes it gets more exciting as you get started. Like it's a fortune cookie work. I so the like, image was pretty interesting, the shininess of it put clear up. I wanted to go ahead and start. But as you get the more involved, it, it gets more interesting. But sometimes I just have to start on something. But I never have like total change of mind from the beginning and the end. But it usually just gets more interesting, more personal as I work. And sometimes do you change your or less works? Uh, for example, you uh, create some work and after two months, three months, you would like to add or change something? After, after a few months, do you ever come back or like wish you had changed something in the artwork after you finished it? No, I, I don't go back. I, I have a few pieces that I wish I just threw them away. I, yeah, lately I don't throw them away, okay. but... Once it's done, I keep on moving. Yeah, okay. Keep on going. Thank you. Okay, so students, very like your work. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, very excited about your inventions and techniques, inventions in the forms, combining different forms, uh, like image, uh, calligraphy. Uh, just great work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I really want to thank Rebecca too for this fantastic It's amazing to see like all the works together in here because my studio is small. I can only see one work at a time. So this is amazing. Thank you, everybody. And are there any other questions from other guests? Yes. A different race, I would assume, asks. And this may have already been answered why there were no landscapes and why you stuck with either portraits or still lives. You already touched on that, and thus you had more thoughts you wanted. I never thought that if I might do it, yeah, uh, <laughs> keep options open. All right, so that brings us to the end of the virtual event. So, thank you so much, Mayuko, for sharing your work with the Wright Gallery and the College Art Center. Um, you're such an inspiration for all the students, as you can see, um, and your show provides invaluable learning experiences for all of our visitors. So from the team of students that help to in install the show and to all the classes teaching where they need to make connections uh, between the course topics and the work. So thank you, Kiana, for co-hosting the event. And thank you to the Wright Gallery intern, Emma, who makes this possible. And thank you to the Wright Gallery Curatorial Committee and Professor Kristoff, did your drawing class for joining us. And all of our guests who have also joined us on Zoom. Thank you very much. So Mayoko's exhibit will be open through October 20th. The gallery is open weekdays, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. If you are unable to visit in person, please visit the Wright Gallery website to find a link to the Flipper photo album where you can see images of the exhibition. And of course, you can find more images of the work on my website and social media. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the, for the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. The work you. is beautiful, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful yeah. show. Thank you very much.